Welcome to ES310 Lesson 28. Today we will be completing our look at energy methods for rigid bodies by looking at the special case where there are only conservative forces on our system and therefore we can use conservation of energy. More information about this topic can be found in Hibbler's Dynamics textbook, Chapter 18, Section 5. So just as it we had in particles, um, if we have no non-conservative forces on our system, or in other words, all of our forces do not depend on path, so we don't have friction or drag or any of these types of forces, we can use conservation of energy instead of work energy. Conservation of energy only looks at the first, in the initial position and the final position. So it says that the kinetic energy plus the potential energy in the first position is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy in the second position. The kinetic energy expression is the same as we have been using in the last couple of lessons. Each body may have a, a kinetic energy due to translation, which is the first term, and a kinetic energy due to rotation, which is the second term. The potential energy expressions are the same as what we used with particles. We generally have potential energy from two sources. From gravity, the potential energy is the weight times the height, where the height is measured above a uh, chosen datum. If the height is below that datum, then this would be negative. The potential energy due to a spring is one-half times the spring constant K times S squared, where S is the stretch in that spring. So the potential energy due to a spring is always positive. The potential energy due to gravity is negative based on the datum that is chosen for the problem. The process that we use in order to solve these conservation of energy method problems is to draw two diagrams, one showing the initial position and one showing the final position. Choose a datum that's convenient for the problem and then determine the gravitational potential energy relative to that data. Write the spring potential energy relative to a zero stretch, and then find the kinetic energy um, for translation and rotation of the center of gravity. Do this for the initial position and the final position, and then apply conservation of energy and solve. Oftentimes you'll have to use kinematics and geometry to relate variables in our equations. So let's take a look at a, a couple of examples of this. In this first example, we have a wheel that rolls down a hill that's connected to a spring. Initially, the spring is unstretched, undeformed, and the center of this disk is moving at a speed of 4 meters per second. From this point, then, the disk runs, rolls down the hill and eventually um, stops moving. And the question is, how far does it move down the hill before this happens? So the disc rolls without slipping, so that gives us some information about the relationship between the speed of the center of mass and the rotational speed of the disc. So, we are going to apply the T plus V1 is equal to T2 plus V2. We know that at the final position, the disk is not moving, so T is equal to zero in the final position. Initially, T1 is going to be simply one-half MVG squared plus one-half I omega squared. From the fact that it's rolling without slipping, we know that VG is equal to R omega, and it's a disk, so we know that I is equal to one-half of mR squared, which, if we plug in the numbers, is one-half of 40 times 0.3 squared, which is 1.8. V1 depends on where we choose our datum. So let's make this simple, and we'll say that the datum is the point where the spring is unstretched, so we're going to have zero potential energy. Then the disk is going to move down below that datum, so our fi if this is our initial position then, our final position 
is going to be down the hill some amount. All right, so if this is our initial position, our final position is going to be down here some distance d. In going down the hill distance d, it's also going to go down rel uh, vertically a distance h. And we can relate d to h by saying that h is equal to d times sine of this angle here, which is 30. So this then, we've already said that T2 is equal to 0. V2 then is going to have an elastic component, 1 half KS squared, and a, and a gravitational component, MGH. And the gravitational component is below the datum, so this is going to be negative. So H is D sine theta. S is the stretch in the spring, which it started unstretched, and it now stretches a distance d. So we can rewrite v2 as 1 half k d squared minus m g d sine of 30. You can plug all of this information into that top equation. We have 1 half of 40, the mass, we're going to write this in terms of the velocity since that's what's given to us. So times the velocity 4 squared plus 1 half i, 1.8. This is then omega is equal to v over r. So omega is 4 divided by 0.3 squared plus v1 is 0 is equal to t2 is 0 plus 1 half k is 200 d squared minus 40 times 9.81 d sine of 30. And the only unknown in this expression is d, so it's a quadratic equation in d, which we can crunch all the numbers, we'll get negative 100 d squared plus 196.2d plus 480 is equal to zero. Plug that into your calculator to solve the quadratic equation. You get two d's. d is either negative 1.42 or 3.38. Negative 4.42 would be moving up the hill. We are interested in the one that moves us down the hill. And so our answer is 3.38 meters. Here's another example of a similar type problem where we have both springs and gravity acting, but no friction, so we can use conservation of energy. We have a garage door, all right, so we've got its weight acting at its center, mg. And we have um, a rope here pulling it upwards that is connected to a spring. And so we're told that when it's released from rest at theta equal to zero, that's when the door is up here. And we're going to call that our datum. And then we need to figure out what omega is when theta is equal to 30. Originally, when it's up at the top, the spring has a stretch of one foot. And we can assume that the door can be treated as a thin plate. A thin plate is, at, is rotating around an axis through its area. So if we look at our table, we know then that I is equal to 1 12th of mass times A squared, where A is the side length perpendicular to that area. So in this case, 8 feet. So this is 1 12th of... 80 divided by 32.2 is our mass times 8 feet squared. So that's what our I is. So let's start writing things out here. In position 1, we have no kinetic energy because it's at rest. And our potential energy has no gravitational component because we chose our datum to be at that point. And we have a a spring component due to the fact that the stretch is one foot, so that's t one half of k times one foot squared.
So that's our initial position. Our final position is where theta is equal to 30, and our kinetic energy there is going to have a translational component and a rotational component. Oops, I, not M. And the relationship between V and omega, if this is rotating, we get V is equal to 8 over 2 omega. Our R is half of this to get to the center of mass. So that's our kinetic energy at that point. Our potential energy at that point is going to be the gravitational potential energy, which is below the datum, so it's negative, mg. H, and our, and our spring potential energy, which is plus one-half K S squared. Now we need to relate H and S to the theta that we're given the 30. So H is this distance below the datum that takes us to the center of mass. So H is going to equal that this hypotenuse is going to be 4. 4 times the sine of 30. And S is a little bit more complicated because S requires us to look at the pulley system. We're going to look at this as a pulley system and we're going to say this distance here um, is S1 and this distance here is S2. And so our pulley system says the length of the rope is equal to S2 plus 2S1. So the change in S2, so the change in length is 0, is equal to the change in S2 plus 2 times the change in S1. The change in S1 is related to the stretch in the spring. So that's the change in the stretch in the spring. So we have then that 2 delta S1 is equal to delta S2. Delta S2 is related to theta. Delta S2 is what's related to theta. It's the long side of this triangle with a hypotenuse of 8. So this is going to be 8 times the sine of 30 is 2 delta S1. So delta S1, delta S1 is equal to 4. 4 sine of 30, and delta S is the increase in the stretch. So S, in this equation, is the initial stretch 1 plus the increase in the stretch 4 sine of theta. And we've now related all of our variables to that 30. So now let's plug this into our T1 plus V1 equals T2 plus V2 equation. We get 0 plus 1 half of 9 times 1 squared is equal to 1 half of the mass times 4 omega squared. We're looking for omega. Plus 1 half of I times omega squared, so that's the kinetic energy, and then we have the potential energy minus W, which is our 80, times H, which is 4 sine of 30, plus 1 half of 9 times, this is 1 plus 2 equal to 3 squared. So I comes from this expression up here. M is 80 divided by 32.2, and we can plug everything in and get an expression of omega, um, of only omega. We crunch the numbers, we get 88 is equal to 26.5 times omega squared, or omega is equal to 1.82 radians per seconds per second.